Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Julie, and I'm speaking with Professor David Schmitz from the Department of Physics at the Enrico Fermi Institute at the University of Chicago. Professor Schmitz is an experimental particle physicist whose work focuses on understanding the basic building blocks that make up our universe, in particular, the subatomic particles known as neutrinos. He is here today to talk about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Schmitz. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like for you to start us off with a general overview of your career path from college years to becoming a professor at the University of Chicago. Can you kind of walk us through the main steps between college and joining the faculty at U Chicago? I'm now a uh, associate professor in the Department of Physics. So I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm an experimental particle physicist. But I definitely did not uh, start out down that path when I first started in college. So I'm originally from Kansas. I, uh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, which was only about 40 minutes from where I grew up. And when I went to school, I originally studied architecture and engineering. My degree was actually in architectural engineering, so which was exactly what it sounds like, kind of a mix of the study of design and the study of structural engineering. I ended up on that path, I think, because it sort of really merged things that I was really interested in in that time in my life, which was the idea of, of deliberate design and careful thinking about uh, solutions to problems, but also a real uh, joy and aptitude for, for math. And uh, so I started out studying architectural engineering for several years, in fact. And in my second year, I took the sort of core physics courses that were part of any engineering degree, you know, a semester of classical mechanics, a semester of electricity and magnetism. I was just completely blown away by what I was learning in those courses. And I just could not get enough of it. And I spent a ton of time talking to the professor that I had taught those courses about the courses themselves, but also for the first time in my life about kind of the larger research that was going on in the field of physics, something that was at the time really completely new to me. But then I went on and I, I spent my third year, uh, my junior year in college studying abroad. I spent the entire year in Germany, but it was through the architecture school. So I went there to study architecture and it was a you know, wonderful experience in my life a, um, in many, many ways. But one of the things I spent that entire year doing was reading every like physics book I could get my hands on, you know, popular science books about modern research. And just I was, you know, sort of obsessed. And when I returned, this is now my fourth year. <laughs> so when I returned, still a architectural engineering major, I wanted to continue taking physics courses. So I signed up for kind of the next level of physics courses that uh, in the progression, which were not at that point at all required for my major, they were beyond what I needed, but I wanted to do it just for my own, my own interest. And I distinctly remember actually my advisor in the engineering school sort of wrinkling his nose and saying like, why, why would you take these courses in modern physics? You know, you don't, you don't need them for your major. And he was kind of adamant about it, actually. He didn't want me to do it to, to spend my time. And that was kind of the beginning of, of the push in a new direction for me when I just really, really realized my passion that I wanted to take those classes and I wanted to continue to explore this. The other thing that happened around that time was the professor who had taught me in those courses connected me with another faculty member in the physics department who was doing research and sort of recommended me for research in, in that group. And so I got my first taste of real research myself. So by, you know, partway through, halfway through or so my fourth year, I had fully shifted direction and, and turned toward physics. Now, in order to still graduate in a finite length of time, I fortunately, my university had a relatively new degree at the time in what was called engineering physics, which is sort of exactly what it sounds like, kind of a marriage of a certain number of upper level physics courses with engineering courses, especially in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. And that enabled me to, to finish quickly, but still set myself out on a path toward a future academic career or academic study in, in physics. This change into engineering physics, it uh, solved exactly the problem that I uh, wanted to solve, which was that it created a pathway then for me to go and pursue a graduate degree in physics to to get into a PhD program in physics. So I went as as sort of uh, complicated as and indirect as that early part of my academic career was. Once I landed uh, on physics, I've been on a pretty pretty straight line path ever since. So 
I went to graduate school. I ended up getting into the PhD program at Columbia. So right after I graduated from KU, I went, uh, I moved to New York City and, and started my PhD there. Uh, I got into a group studying experimental neutrino physics uh, with experiments that are being done at Fermilab, a lab right here in the uh, Chicagoland area. And I've been working on a variety of different experiments in that field ever since. I did my PhD working on experiment at Fermilab. I was then a postdoc working at Fermilab for, uh, for about four years. And then at that point, the physics department here at the University of Chicago was in many ways you know, the, the sort of dream job for me at that level, because it enabled me to, you know, come to a wonderful university with a top-notch physics department, but also be very close to my research, which continues to this day to be uh, right next door at, uh, at the Fermi National Laboratory out in the uh, western suburbs of Chicago. So there's a lot of points I want to dig into, but before we get there, can you tell me a little bit about the research that you do now? Can you give a broad summary of your specialization and your work? Yeah. So as I hinted at earlier, I study neutrino physics. So we study the certain type of subatomic particle known as the neutrino. It's kind of the, the least known maybe of the fundamental particles. Most people have heard of quarks. Quarks are the uh, fundamental objects that go to make up things like protons and neutrons that sit at the nucleus of every atom. Everybody's, most people have heard of the electron, of course, and the electrons also exist in regular matter all around us because they uh, also exist in every atom. And then there's a, another class of, of particles that we know about in the universe known as the neutrino. And the neutrino is very special because it doesn't interact with the, in the using the same forces that the quarks and the electrons do. It only interacts through the very weakest of the known fundamental forces in nature. It's, we literally call it the weak force. <laughs> it's a, a, the weak nuclear force. And this gives neutrinos kind of a unique property that they're inert and they very seldom interact with other matter. So they will typically pass directly through huge chunks of matter before they'll interact. Approximately you know, hundreds of trillions of neutrinos are passing through each of our bodies every second that were originally produced at the core of the sun a few minutes ago. And this gives the neutrino a couple of rare properties and opens up some exciting opportunities. So the first is that it means if a neutrino gets produced somewhere in the universe, that it will travel potentially to the Earth, but it will travel unimpeded. So it doesn't get messed up by passing through other objects or get impacted by magnetic fields that exist in the universe along its way. So if you can detect that neutrino, it is a direct messenger from whatever exotic source that it came from at any distance across the universe, which is kind of a unique property and exciting property. The other is understanding the characteristics of the neutrinos themselves, which is challenging because they interact so feebly. And so what I do in the experiments that I'm working on right now are targeted at that second question. It's understanding the basic characteristics of the neutrino themselves, how they behave, how they do interact with other matter in a very precise way, because that gives us a way to understand their role in the universe through how they are interacting with the rest of the rest of the known particles. And we believe that neutrinos potentially play very important roles going all the way back to the very earliest moments, the tiniest fractions of a second after the Big Bang due to their unique properties. And that's one of the big questions that we're trying to explore today with our research. I want to talk a bit about how you got to the place you are in your career. And I want to ask specifically about people who were influential to you or who mentored you in some way. Who are one or two or three people throughout your career? It could be a teacher, a family member, or someone you looked up to, but who would you credit as someone who is really responsible for the place where you are today? Yeah, I, I already mentioned uh, one early professor that I had in physics who really kind of opened his office door, literally, to me to uh, to tell me about the world of physics as I started to get excited about it. And and then, just as importantly, introduced me then to other people with which I could work with. And my, my research advisors then, both as an undergraduate and in graduate school, were, you know, enormously influential for me. And I was thinking, you know, if I look back, what they had in common was a very high level of trust and giving me a lot of autonomy to explore 
the research that I was doing and take on a lot of responsibility to deliver important results or to do important studies or build things in the lab. And recognizing that that would take time for somebody new to the field to navigate and understand, but uh, allowing me the kind of freedom to to take that time and to really figure things out. Uh, and then as a result, then make significant contributions to that research, meaningful contributions um, to that research. As an undergraduate, I you know built some systems that needed to be deployed in our experiment. And our experiment just happened to be located at the South Pole in Antarctica. And so during my senior year, my research advisor took me with him on a trip to uh, to the South Pole to deploy that equipment. And, uh, and at the time, that was totally unexpected and exhilarating and certainly contributes to, to where my uh, research path went after that and my sort of addiction to, uh, to this research. Then uh, similarly later, as a, as a graduate student, my advisor sent me to CERN to work on an experiment that we desperately needed results from to that fed in to the neutrino project we were doing at Fermilab. And I went along as part of a very small team. There was one postdoc and one scientist from one of the national laboratories. And we went and worked on this project for three or four years with many trips to CERN to take the data, to collaborate with people, to understand the data and, and ultimately produce a, a result. And then I brought that back to the experiment at Fermilab, or we did, as, uh, as an input to the neutrino experiment that we were working on there. But it was something that I really got to kind of own and you'll know, feel responsible for, but learn a lot <laughs> in, uh, as, I, as I figured out how to, to make those, to realize those results. Can you tell me about some specific challenges that you face in your career? It could be like just the challenge of self-doubt or questioning the path you were on or a very specific lack of funding or a, a, a more outside tangible challenge you face. But what have been some of the, the challenges you faced in your career and how have you pushed through them? Yeah, I can think of a couple. One was certainly when I started graduate school, because as I told you, I'd pivoted to physics quite late. And so I felt very behind. I had not taken the full suite of courses that a normal physics major would take during an undergraduate degree. I kind of crammed a couple of physics classes in the last year or two to try to prepare myself as well as I could for graduate school. And uh, so when I got to graduate school, I was really, I felt a little behind and, uh, and I really needed to catch up with, with my peers. And the group that I went to graduate school with, there was a, I believe there were 18 of us in my class. And added to the long list of people that I owe a lot of uh, a debt of gratitude to for, you know, helping me get along in my career was that group of what became very close friends who, uh, who helped me along, right, who, who had more experience in physics and, and, uh, and who really um, carried me through those first couple of years of classes and through a qualifying exam, a PhD qualifying exam that was part of the program at Columbia at the time. Um, that was maybe more of a struggle for me than it, given the the uh, the change that I had recently made in my direction, and and they they fortunately pulled me through. And then similarly, when I fast forward to starting as uh, a member of the faculty here at the University of Chicago, I think that's a step that feels overwhelming for most people. It certainly did for me, kind of thrilling and exciting, but but scary at the same time. Again, it was it was the help and the support of colleagues. In, uh, in the department here at the university who have since become very good friends who, uh, who showed me the ropes and helped me understand how to navigate those earliest months and years of, of an of a academic career and, uh, and eventually land on, on my feet. And uh, so it was, it was challenging, but again, with, with the help of, of others, it, it was uh, able to, to work out. A lot of our audience are students, either undergraduate or early graduate students who are considering entering into an academic field. And I would love to hear from you when and how and why you decided to pursue a field as a, or a profession and why you decided to pursue a job as a professor and working with students in, additional, in addition to research rather than a purely research job or a purely industry job. What was one of the driving factors behind choosing to be an academic? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and in fact, when I was nearing the end of my postdoc and I was looking for long-term positions in, in research, 
the another place that I looked very seriously was at Fermilab, right? Fermilab, of course, has a large staff of uh, scientists, and I had applied for a position there as well, and which would have made a lot of sense, right? All of the research that I I had, was doing at the time uh, and I'm still doing is is based at Fermi Lab and it would have been certainly a very exciting research career and I ultimately decided to come to the University of Chicago for a lot of reasons but the large distinction here is the opportunity to uh, to work with students to teach as you said but at at a couple of different levels so there's there's teaching courses, whether to undergrads or graduate students, something that I am very passionate about and, and really in love, uh, enjoy doing very, very much. But then there's also mentoring graduate students who are doing research, doing their own PhD research. And by coming to the university, I knew that that would be a significant importance part of, of, my, of my job and of my career. And those were things that I was quite passionate about and excited about and, uh, and wanted to, to take on. And so in the end, choosing the university path where I would be able to continue my research, but also mentor and teach students at, uh, at various levels was, was an easy decision in the end. What do you currently find most inspirational in your work? It could be working with students or in the research you do, but what feels like it is inspiring to you and keeps you motivated and keeps you, keeps you focused on, on the path that you're moving on? The, the field of experimental particle physics is is somewhat unique in the time scales and just the the scales of projects that we pursue in a lot of different dimensions, whether that's cost or the number of people involved or the time it takes to bring an experiment from its earliest stages of the idea to the design, to the construction, to the execution, to the analysis. Those time scales can be very long, um, you know, decades. <laughs> so absolutely getting to that final goal, getting to that, that new understanding or answering the question that we have been after for all of that time. You know, the reason we built the experiment in the first place is certainly a driving force, right? You, you can't wait to get to that eventual data and then analysis and, and to see, uh, to reveal that mystery of the, of the universe that you're after. But given the, given the somewhat unique timescales that are involved, there's there's a sort of a second scale at which I think it's doing this work is really motivating. And that is more at the kind of daily scale or the, you know, the shorter time scales. And that's where you're every day you're solving kind of smaller problems along the way. And that's where, you know, working in a research group at the university where there's a number of graduate students or postdocs who are all working on these problems every day and trying to solve everything that comes up, whether it's a a problem with a piece of hardware or whether it's trying to develop a new piece of software that implements some algorithm for ways to analyze the data and just this long series of of small smaller things to tackle that are just really exciting and really fun and and it works well or it's it's fun to work with a team of uh of researchers on those problems every day and uh and how those build up then to a, a major milestone, like the final result from some big experiment that we've been working for for such a long time. And so those two scales are really complementary to each other. And I think about them both all the time. <laughs> what would you say is the most fun thing about your current job as a professor at the University of Chicago? What feels the most exciting or the most joyful? I would say the, the thing that brings the most just sort of sparks of, of, of joy on a regular basis for me right now is probably teaching. I tend to teach a lot of the large introductory physics courses. So this, again, is, is introductions to classical mechanics, introductions to electricity and magnetism. These are larger courses, 150, 170 students in a big kind of lecture auditorium, typically. And these are exactly the same courses that got me so enthralled and excited about physics when I was taking those classes many years ago now. And so teaching those classes to a new you know, group of students every year, seeing them realize what I thought was so thrilling and, and fascinating about these concepts as I explain them to them and share them and work problems with them is really fun for me. Like my favorite part of teaching a class is office hours, right? Where I get a few dozen students to come in for a few hours and we just go over problems and talk about concepts and try to tie things together from what seem like 
different parts of the course, but are actually sort of, sort of connected at their root and make those connections. And it's 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 real joy for me to to work with that group of students throughout an entire course, and uh, and then do that get to do that again every year is is really fun. Is there anything about your current job that you don't like as much? I know I asked about challenges you faced in the past. And again, this question's a little more focused on the the present. Um, are there things in your current role that feel tedious or less fun or, yeah, just that are, are not as enjoyable about the work that you do at the University of Chicago? I wouldn't point at any particular aspect of of my job and say that something is is unfun or tedious or or boring. Instead, I think the challenge comes in that there there seem to be so many different facets to the job that sometimes are in conflict with one another. So I love each of those facets. I enjoy each of those facets, but it's not always possible to keep up with them all at the same time. So you know, research is, of course, uh, a prime focus and a um, of everything that I do, and it's you know very important to me personally and very. A very exciting piece of of my work and the whole reason I want to be here, right? But teaching is also a, a a big responsibility, but it's also a great joy, and I love doing it. But to do it well takes a lot of time and a lot of tension, uh, a lot of work. And then I'd say there's a third aspect to being uh, a member of a faculty and university, and that's uh, some amount of of service or administration work within your department or your division at different levels where you're. Um, you know, trying to make your department better, whether that's creating new programs or you're changing how the teaching is done, or you're, you know, you're running a committee that to search for new members of the faculty or the next generation or the next group of graduate students through an admissions process. And all of that is, is really important work as well. And I, I take it very seriously because I hope that, you know, if done well, it makes um, our department even better as we move forward. But those are three kind of totally separate uh, aspects of of the job of being a, a professor and in, in that it's hard to keep up with all of those things at the same time. And that's the biggest challenge, I would say, for me is making time for for all of those different different aspects and not falling behind on any of them. What advice would you have for someone who is interested in pursuing a, a career in academia and specifically a career in physics and an academic career in physics? What advice would you have to someone who is an undergraduate or even an early graduate student? Yeah, I think really important is to uh, try to explore the different areas of research in, in this case in physics um, as early as you can. That's both just understanding what kind of research is being done out there through attending department colloquia or other uh, opportunities to hear about ongoing research. Of course, getting involved in research yourself as early as you can is is really important and can can teach you a lot and provide a lot of opportunities for you. So, you know, applying for summer research opportunities or speaking with members of the of your department and looking for ways that you can get involved. And kind of coupled to that, I think important is just seeking out good mentors, whether that's someone you're doing research with or someone else in the department. Doesn't always have to be faculty, but it's great if it can be. There's graduate students and postdocs, anyone kind of ahead of of you in your career that can uh, offer some perspective and and advice. And those those relationships and what you can learn from from good mentors and is uh, is very powerful and and very important. So so definitely seek out those opportunities everywhere that you can. What would you say is the most gratifying part about your job currently? What's the most gratifying thing? that you do? So I think that, you know, running a research a research group at a university like this is sometimes it feels like you kind of run your own small business or something, right? Like it's a, it's an enterprise. It's an enterprise with a, with a, with a very exciting goal toward learning something new about, you know, physics in this case, about the universe, about neutrinos, but it's, it's an enterprise that is collaborative and requires kind of a, a just a a collective effort of a of a different group of people working on different things and you know there's at any given time there's just a lot going on with the different analyses that each graduate student is working on toward their own PhD uh, we have undergraduates doing different research projects uh, throughout the year 
And it feels like a little, like I said, like a, a small, almost like running a small business where we, you know, we all are working on the same team to some with some ex- some goal in mind. That goal just happens to be these exciting questions and research that we're that we're seeking answers for. And I'm I'm just very proud of our group and the work that they do. The students that have come through and graduated, the students that are here now, and uh, and it's extremely gratifying to see them come through and be a part of our team for a while, but then go on to their uh, their careers beyond here. You know, I have graduate students that are now doing really interesting postdocs. I have former postdocs that are now uh, in their own faculty positions at different universities. And and just to have been a part of their career when have them have been a part of our little team here for a while before they move on is just, but then keeping up with them uh, after they go is, is really, is just a really humbling and satisfying part of, of the job that I, uh, that I have here. Thank you again, Professor Schmitz, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.